for the coming panel. The third panel, we are uh, very pleased to have Dr. Arlo Pichelli uh, from IFPRI, who will be uh, presenting. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for having me here and the opportunity to share some of the ongoing work that we have been doing in this area. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be talking to you about a prospective study that's ongoing, starting about a year and a half ago, really looking at uh, the effectiveness of scaling up uh, an integrated agriculture nutrition intervention through a, a poultry bag uh, system. So my slide is going to be a little different from the great presentation we had this morning. It's going to tie up a little bit with the Sarah's one uh, in terms of looking at the complexity of things and sort of how do you measure impact when you're looking at so many different patterns? So many different ways in which things happen. So pathways help, but what to do when you don't even know exactly how the pathways work, which ties up really to the uh, the size, you know, the presentation of change made. So when you need the end, we don't really understand what the EED is fully about. You know, how do you go about trying to sort of get a good picture of, of things? In a nutshell, you see how do you consider you know a job well done when you're only looking at part of the problem. In a nutshell, that kind of is really my, my career. In some ways, I justify my job by trying to understand complex systems. And the rationale for this work really uh, span out of the sort of 2013 Nancy series of Actually, before I start, because you know, a set of graphics studies is some of their great title, but it's good to know who you're talking to. So, how many of you put your hands up if you have a health background? Okay. How about the agriculture background? Good. Social sciences. How about engineering? I see, so a few engineers as well, you know, <laughs> and it's terrific. So, uh, th this study that I'm, I'm going to present is also a, a multidisciplinary study. You know, involves contributions of a huge team, including Dan Kelly and you know, a couple other colleagues, but also vets, you know, and other epidemiologists, and uh, an ever growing team, actually. Because as we continue to unpack some of these pathways, we try and bring in key experts to help us out. Uh, but the rationale for this recent is uh, seven out of the 2013 months kind of said, look, we need to do a little bit better in terms of accelerating products and addressing nutrition uh, problems. And the idea is really to try and make other sectors work a little better towards nutrition. So agriculture and food can be a key contribution. And um, particularly in, in addressing the underlying determinants of nutrition. And livestock within agriculture is clearly a key sector. On one hand, as a source of high quality protein and bioavailable micronutrients, as a potential source for income and productive assets, corporate food security, for instance. But at the same time, there are issues related to health that need to be considered uh, explicit. There are often overlooked. And the wash sector, in particular, has fo focused very little on livestock uh, management and animal feces disposal in the past. And um, there's increasing evidence that there's elevated health risks from uh, poultry, uh, so from livestock rearing practices and, and childcare, even though we don't really uh, fully understand the mechanism. We've talked about EED as a as potential pathway. And uh, poultry are a particular concern in this space because poultry, like dairy experimentation, highlights that are our pre uh, We're talking about contexts where you know, 90% of households. Uh, like working at fast when this particular study is set, uh, actually have poultry, and um, and it's scavenging poultry systems. So essentially, poultry are free to roam around, and uh, there's no physical separation between poultry and, and childcare. Hey, can you put your hands up if you've seen this slide before? So this is one, two, okay. So this is, in some ways, the UNICEF framework two point zero, right? But the reason why I like it so much because it kind of really brings uh, a, a try to set a common language across the different disciplines that kind of are engaged to try and make uh, things work better for nutrition. So you have in blue the, the sort of the uh, immediate determinants of nutrition, sort of leading up to optimal child nutrition. And what they've done here is also bring in what the term development to kind of highlight maybe the end point that we're really uh, uh, concerned about as. Uh, you know, to maybe shift away the focus entirely on growth, and really try and bring the child development aspects more um, explicitly in focus. The other thing they do quite neatly is also broaden the, uh, uh, the focus onto the lifestyle. So, you know, instead of just entirely focusing on the early uh, 
that's what a prefix section has in the window to broaden it and kind of say that there are things that we can do that have potential uh, benefits in other age groups. And also, it clearly highlights where uh, where the entry points for agriculture, which is sort of the green the green boxes. And um, I kind of highlighted sort of the, the, the traditional sort of uh, production to consumption pathway, which is the sort of green box, which sort of leads to essentially uh, product producing better foods and feeding into the diet, and then that leading to improved nutrition. The orange box kind of says, look, there's something that you know. There, Mediating pathways to, to, to care. And often we're talking about mother's time. And um, you know, you need to start thinking about you know, the time that mothers do dedicate to childcare versus the time, for instance, that you spend in terms of uh, generating income and the role they have in decision making, as Sarah really presented this morning. But the red box essentially highlights so there are also risks that need to be factored in. And immediately when you start seeing these, these complex pathways, you start Think about trade offs. So, this is just to give you the background of this plus randomized trial that we uh, just started about a year and a half ago, set in Burkina Faso. And the idea was to evaluate the impact of an integrated agriculture nutrition intervention that really used a poultry value chain system as a platform to scale up a, 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 an intervention package that um, included a set of activities aimed at optimizing decision making, so knowledge. A set of activities aimed at improving poultry value chain activities, and a set of activities at, aimed at improving women's empowerment. Okay, so this this slide here was my best attempt at trying to sort of um, come up with generalized pathways that weren't too complicated, but kind of tried to put together sort of how the different elements of the package would try and get you to to to, to your endpoint, which in this case was diet, diet, nutrition, child development. So on the one hand, we have a sort of a set of demands, what I call the sort of demand set path, which is really geared around um, food consumption and um, behaviors related to choices around food and health seeking behaviors. On the bottom, you have the sort of livelihood and agriculture production marketing side path, supply side path, sort of trying to give you essentially uh, improved production practices, improved outputs, improved uh, quantities of nutritious foods produced and sold and consumed at home. And these two sort of pathways sort of intersect or are sort of linked together essentially by uh, women's time, decision making, and role in, in the different household practices. Um, there are all sorts of other pathways that are linked to a specific food chain uh, processes, but in some ways, those are many steps removed from your endpoints you want to measure. Um, the intervention itself so had a, a component around uh, behavior change, so providing information on how to optimize diets using foods that are available during the different seasons, targeting specific age groups. So I think the intervention itself actually uh, was focusing on women's diets. But we, of course, saw that as an opportunity to grow the to look at um, young children as well. And then it had a package really uh, geared around trying to increase uh, or strengthen value chain services linked to inputs and uh, input provision and credit, for example, production practices, uh, particularly uh, linked to uh, use of vaccination. So for those of you that know Burkina Faso, the poultry production systems there are pretty informal, and uh, one of the sort of biggest livestock risks that they face is linked to new task systems, which hits year on year, very predictable and um, essentially manageable through use, the use of vaccinations, but uh, there's very, very low uptake. So the intervention in itself, which really tried to, to, to strengthen these different components and, and really try and make sort of these pathways active, to sort of uh, try and build on synergies between these different pathways to try and get uh, an impact. Uh, so this is already giving you a sense of the challenge you have when you have to measure the impact type of intervention because you, you have so many different things you need to measure and um and there's a lot of trade-offs involved and so for instance you know uh, the, the, the women's roles in, in decision making is often um overlooked as i was saying it's difficult to measure but it's critical in terms of um, understanding how the intervention can be effective um and measuring that for instance is, 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 is a huge challenge 
and, um, and time consuming. Then, of course, you have all the, the biological pathways that you know, link in some ways uh, your top right hand boxes to your impact boxes, right? That, you know, names might impact a little bit more today, but there's often there's a lot of black boxes in there that we're not too, too, too clear in terms of uh, mechanisms. So, you know, in terms of your design, you, know, you need to start making decisions. You know, where, where, where are your priorities in terms of primary outcomes and things like that? And um, it's not as clear cut uh, as designing a text trial with uh, single intellect. Here you're talking about really complex um, mechanisms that operate that often simulate. And these, these, these mechanisms often have very seasonalities involved as well, right? So, it is related to diet, which is probably the, the stuff I know most about. Um, we're talking about contexts that are, you know, uh, extremely variable between sort of the pre harvest season and the post harvest season. So, depending on uh, where you are and what you want to measure, the opportunities for having improvements, say, in diet in the, in the pre harvest season are, are very different from those in the post harvest season, as well as other margins for improvement. Luckily, we, we worked with a funder that was uh, extremely flexible. So this is all uh, Miller Miller the Gates Foundation funding. And we, we, we worked very closely with New Inspire Institute by the Shine Trial that un undertook very comprehensive formative research to try and give us a sense of really where are the entry points for interventions, where are the main constraints, and how can interventions really make a difference. Um, so we designed uh, mixed methods formative research that included sort of standard literature reviews, and then a uh, very focused um, primary data collection, really geared to understand um, essentially the oral fecal pathways that, um, that kids were exposed to, essentially to get a better handle on the risks that these poultry uh, farming systems have as the children. So I don't know if you, you read about the Shine Trial, but it is essentially you know, having um, surveys, essentially shadow households and kids, and you know, basically recording uh, intervals, you know, the timings and the, the frequency at which kids put either soil or chicken pieces or even their dairy pans in their mouths throughout, say, a, a three or four hour um, period. So very labor intense, but they, they, you know, they, they give you a real sense of where, where the entry points are for, for interventions. Um, what we found essentially was that, yeah, so we're talking about, you know, pervasive, low, very low water, uh, washing by this chain. Both at community level and at the house. And you know, poultry systems were essentially um, completely informal. We're talking about um, uh, distribution of sort of ranging from about six to 90 percent. So we said 90 percent of households had chickens, and say the chicken distribution ranged from about a minimum of around four or five chickens up to say uh, over a couple of cases of having one more than a thousand chickens, but mostly say spread between the, the, the sort of five to a hundred chickens. Um, and animal feces were pervasive. You know, so you, you basically, um, I don't know how many of you know about the puzzle, but you, you're essentially talking about these enlarged households which essentially have um, groupings of, uh, of uh, what we call restricted households. And essentially the compound revolves around the central area of that sort of food is prepared and food is uh, and uh, sort of household life that was on their own. And essentially, chickens are free to roam pretty much at their own uh, life. They essentially scavenge the food. And, um, but there's really very little in terms of separating, separating out uh, childcare spaces from, from, from chickens. So, you know, chickens, you know, there's some pretty stark, stri striking images of sort of chicken feeding from the same bowls where, chicken, where children are eating and children having to fight chickens off. Uh, you know, chicken stools uh, being sort of surrounding food preparation areas, um, and you know, with a number of uh, possibilities for contamination. Um, what practices that could potentially provide a barrier to, to, to contamination are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty low. When it comes to toilet ownership, for example, pretty low levels, uh, water supply, uh, say about between 40 and 50 percent of households had unprotected wells. And the hand washing is basically non existent. And um, so essentially, it started to give us an idea of what the different entry points were. And talking to the Shine team and the Shine, what well, the Shine trial did, they thought really carefully on how to break these oral pathways, but very much focusing at the house level and the house space. 
And, um, but what we found is in some ways that there was that sort of community level uh, washing behind that was also a major constraint, right? And sort of, we said, can we find ways of um, maybe using these sort of community and as an entry point for household level uh, changes that we want to see? And that was very much the, um, the idea behind this enhanced wash farm that we, that we ended up designing, which really was the only constraint we had, I guess, from the funders was really, there was no transfers, uh, no financial transfers that were, uh, could be made of it. So the essential the essence is how could we use information better? And the idea was to try and sort of integrate messaging that was poultry and livestock specific within these sort of community electoral sanitation approaches that really start off at the community level to try and understand the pathways and the sort of main constraints at the community level in terms of improving wash generally and tackling open defecation, but using those as sort of uh, entry points to then work at the house. And then deal with uh, very much trying to separate out poultry and kids. Um, and essentially, it's women that, that, that look like looking after both poultry and, and, and the kids. So, it's finding ways for women to meaningfully being able to go about their work, but at the same time, try and tackle these, these particular constraints. So, this was all in the context of, uh, of this impact evaluation where you know, the, uh, the implementers themselves were only interested in finding out whether they had any so we designed this sort of um, uh, sort of nested two-level randomized trial. First level was really looking at comparing uh, this intervention package to control that intervention. And, uh, and then we designed a sub-study that tried to really tease out some of these uh, nuances when it comes to look, looking at essentially the potential trade-offs between uh, having increased poultry production as a, a channel to improve diets your income, but in, in some way also potentially a higher risk for kids in terms of exposure to zoonotic disease. And um, so we, we worked across three regions in Burkina Faso and designed a customer trial in 60 communities, which is the community sort of district level. So we we're able to randomize at district level between these uh, market based interventions and a pure control. And then uh, we, we divided it around up. Uh, to including uh, an army in an enhanced washroom project and a standard income, so that we could compare uh, at these different levels, the different interventions. So the study outcomes, we, we were focused primarily um, at the first level, right, in terms of trying to get a sense of how the intervention improved diets, and diets for women and diet for kids. So we really, uh, you know, based on those pathways that I showed earlier, Sort of really prioritize those outcomes into dietary uh, related behaviors um, for women and for kids, but also try to get a sense of what was happening in terms of the poultry production uh, pathway. So, already, you know, we have a range of I think eight primary outcomes. So, you know, you're talking about a trial that is very, very, very tricky. But um, all these other outcomes that we had to measure, you know, <laughs> and uh, honestly, it's, it's, it's Incredible, and but it's in some ways it's essential, right? Because we, we really need to, to get a better handle of the trade offs, right? So, um, all these these dimensions also include you know very uh, detailed modules that we're able to sort of measure both at the different uh, uh, data collection points. But what we also have to do is also measure uh, intermediate outcomes as well, right? To really get a sense of what pathways are moving when. This is just to give you a sense of the, uh, the, the study what the study area. So it's true, yes, it's a relatively small trial. We're talking about 120 clusters, you know, 1,800 households, um, the panel of, say, 1,018 uh, mother child diets that we we're going to follow up through the study. But it is spread out over quite a, a large area of the country, which gives you a little bit more external validity, but obviously it's a bit of a challenge in terms of measurement, particularly when you have to get schools. And schools are minus 80 degrees, you know, within, within an hour, let's say, of the children being improved. And children don't put on demand, right? So I can't tell you, you know, the strategies that we had to develop to try and sort of uh, collect all the data in, in a meaningful way. I'm happy to elaborate, but, you know, before lunch, I wouldn't want to go into too much detail. This is just to give you a sense of, of the, the time for the 
study. So, you know, we had essentially a 12 year, as a 12, 12 month uh, lead up period that really did a lot of design. The formative research really helped in terms of getting a sense of where we should prioritize a measurement, what our intervention should look like, and who else we can bring into the team to try and give us a sense of um, where the, uh, what the measurement for the institutions would be, particularly with regards to schools. So if we has never really what the schools look for. So it was a real uh, steep learning curve for us. Um, then what we decided to do is essentially have a baseline followed up by um, a lean season, second baseline, our first follow up. Just because we knew from pre previous work that both on the dietary related sort of outcomes and the poultry production related outcomes, there's huge seasonalities. <laughs> So we kind of say, you know, this intervention maybe have differential effects depending on what season you're in. And these differential effects from earlier work that we had done in different countries could be pretty big, particularly when you're talking about information alone. So those are essentially the first two uh, data rounds um, that we've just completed. So we're essentially um, in uh, at the sort of point that follows the August 2017 lean season data collection round, and we're right in the middle of sort of doing more of the observational data analysis, really trying to look at what our data looks like across the different outcomes and trying to tease out associations between these, uh, these different pathways. The idea then is to get a sense of, of how the implementation of the intervention. So um, I can't tell you how much data we have. Uh, you know, those pathways, you know, maybe the, the, the baseline household interview took a day. So imagine like, sitting down with, with um, you know, the survey team and they would essentially arrive early in the morning, start collecting data. Different members of the household, starting maybe with the main caregivers or the household head, going through a whole range of social economic uh, modules and isolating the mothers and children, going through the traditional health and health recall, waiting for the child to prove, and doing a whole set of biomedical work around blood. And so, you know, I think, you know, after the first round of households, sort of looking at us and trying to run away as soon as we came, we came back from the new season. Right? So we wanted to give them a little break. And, you know, the, um, this year, we, we spent a lot of time trying to run back uh, all the risk data sets and focus on the process evaluation that would then lead up into the, uh, the more detailed uh, measurements that uh, are in mind. And one thing we, we were asked to do as well is, is quite interesting is to look at sustainability. So, the whole idea behind these information type of things is to kind of say, um, you know, how sustainable are they? I mean, they don't really um, um, rely on transfers. Uh, so potentially, they're not, they're not very costly compared to, say, uh, providing households with all sorts of infrastructure. What's the potential for these effects to be sustained after the intervention setting? So we, we built a sustainability and to, to, to the study itself, to sort of bring us to the sort of leverage. But just to conclude, um, what we know that there's you know there's definitely potential benefits in terms of making agriculture work and livestock systems work better for nutrition, but there are also important trade-offs, uh, possibly related to the health and the livestock, uh, zoonotic disease elements, and exposure to these types of pathogens, and we don't quite understand these, these trade-offs yet. Um, we know a lot, of, a lot more, let's say, about the potential benefits in terms of some of the elements of the internet, but we, we, get, we don't really have a good sense of how, how these different benefits and challenges sort of operate as a whole. Um, there's a lot of research that's needed, not only in terms of assessing the impact of these interventions, but also unpacking the mechanisms. I think there's really a lot of black boxes that we, we're still having to, to, to manage. And it's, that's a sort of huge challenge as well to be able to do good research when you have a long time back. Um, and you know, there's also research related to measurement. So um, a lot of the questions that we ask to get a sense of the potential risks that uh, household related practices have on kids rely on spot, spot checks and uh, very subjective measures of, of cleanliness, for example. Um, so those are obviously very tricky to, to work on. And um, another key area I think that would be really interesting to come back is sort of try and tease out a little bit uh, the pathways that sort of lead to nutrition and child development. We've seen 
and some some differential effects, right, from the shine trial and the I think it's probably an opportunity now to start being a little bit more explicit, teasing out uh, what the me these mechanisms could be, because the interventions could probably have, um, you know, uh, you could actually tweak interventions differently if you if you had a particular focus on child development, so rather than nutrition. Um, I think that. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Dr. So thank you very much. Um, the presentation that I will give you uh, is, is different from the other presentations because there will be no results. We're just uh, starting the project, so I'll talk about the design, but also what I'll try to do is connect all the dots that have been presented uh, to you this morning. Uh, because they have all been important uh, sources of information that we built our, our project on. So the, the project is about uh, children, chickens, eggs, environmental dysfunction. We've called it CAGED, which is an acronym for Campylobacter uh, Environmental Enteric uh, Dysfunction um, and Genetics. Um, and, and all of these will be appearing um, in, um, in in the study uh, design. First of all, uh, Bola earlier this morning, when many of you were not in the room, uh, introduced the uh, future uh, um, innovation lab for livestock systems, and, and our project is under the umbrella of the future uh, uh, livestock lab. Um, and overall, what the lab aims to do is to reduce undernutrition stunting. Um, because it has very important long-term effects in your brain development in children under two. And we know that animal source foods are the best source of multiple stunting preventing nutrients and are lacking in the desire in the diets of most poor in this world. So what the livestock lab aims to do is to sustainably improve livestock productivity and consumption to improve human nutrition, health and incomes. All those pillars that Sarah mentioned uh, that would in the end be the essential pathways to improve the child growth. We work in eight countries uh, for, for the poor grant in Asia, Africa, um, and we have now funded 27 research projects, uh, research for development projects on human and animal nutrition, on diseases, on food safety, on policy, on gender, and on capacity building. So a very broad portfolio that's funded by USAID with uh, a leader grant of 49 uh, millions and in addition to that um, around the time that uh, this project was funded USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation signed uh, an agreement that uh, the Gates Foundation would co-fund some of the initiatives uh, funded by USAID and our project actually was the first one that was selected for that funding. Um, again uh, the structure is complex uh, we have an overarching project that we call ECAP um, and the aim of that project is strengthening smallholder livestock systems for the future. There's two sub-projects, uh, a feed project that we are not discussing this morning, uh, aiming at improving the supply of quality feed for dairy cows in Ethiopia and small ruminants in Burkina Faso. And then there's the cage project, Campbell Vector Genomics and Environmental Dysfunction, that aims at uh, looking at the impacts of uh, chickens, both the positive and the negative impacts on the health and the growth of children, and that's uh, only being done in Ethiopia. The whole project will take uh, five years. Um, the, uh, a very quick summary of the evidence that, that you heard this morning um, about nutritional interventions to prevent stunting. Mark mentioned that micronutrient-based interventions, plant-based foods, do have significant but modest effects. Stunting has defined as uh, uh, a deficit in growth, lengths for age of two standard deviations. These interventions typically will address 0.2, 0.3 uh, uh, of, of those two standard deviations. So about 10% of all of the stunting can be controlled by any single intervention uh, that's based on micronutrients or plant-based foods. Animal source foods have the potential to have a much bigger impact on stunting because they are a high quality source of proteins, vitamins, of micronutrients, um, and they're all uh, in a very high bioavailability. And we know that these uh, foods are largely lacking in the diet of the world's poor. Already mentioned uh, the uh, Ayanata study in Ecuador, 
where they provided one egg a day to children six to nine months of age for six months, and that reduced the LAZ score by 0.63 and it reduced them by 47%. Spectacular effect compared to many of the other interventions that have been taking place. But again, it's only 0.63 uh, standard deviations of the two that we would like to, uh, to address. So there's no nutritional intervention at the moment alone that has fully prevented stunting. And it's already been mentioned, in addition to adequate nutrition, adequate adequate control of infectious disease agents is needed. And that's what our project functions on. This diagram um, looks somewhat complex, uh, was uh, designed by, uh, uh, published about uh, four years ago now, uh, the vicious cycle of diseases of poverty, also called the triple burden of the impoverished uh, gut, uh, designed by Dick Wellens from the University of Virginia. And it, it, it shows that there's this vicious cycle between enteric infections uh, with or without uh, diarrhea, ultimately leading to malnutrition through uh, either the direct impact of diarrheal disease or through the chronic gut inflammation and the reduced uh, gut health. Malnutrition then makes children more susceptible to ent enteric uh, infections. So this cycle tends to reinforce itself uh, perpetually if there's no uh, no, no break in that cycle. And this diagram suggests that there's four ways that you can try to interrupt that cycle. One would be through providing antimicrobials or vaccines, as we discussed this morning, as, as approaches that are being tried to repair the nutrients uh, that the children are provided, to restore the gut health by uh, providing probiotics, uh, or in another way, uh, modulate the, the gut microflora, or through water and sanitation uh, interventions. Already also mentioned that malnutrition is not a syndrome on its own. It leads to long-term effects. It leads to impaired vaccine response, it leads to cognitive impairment, and ultimately to poverty. What we also know now is that when children who have stunted at a young age are later in life having access to high-calorie foods, they have uh, an increased risk of um, obesity and other comorbidities uh, that are related to metabolic uh, malfunction. So, um, as Bola likes to say, uh, stunting is a life sentence uh, and you can prevent it, but it's only a very uh, short time window that stunting can effectively be uh, prevented. What we try to do in our study is uh, to intervene on two of those pathways. We try to repair the nutrient supply of children by providing them eggs, and we're also trying to reduce the exposure to enteric pathogens by improving the sanitation around uh, the children uh, as they uh, grow up. What about, what do we know about sanitation? These trials have also been mentioned. Uh, the wash benefits uh, study in Bangladesh and Kenya, basically asking the question, can wash and nutrition, nutritional interventions prevent early life linear growth faltering and are combined wash interventions more effective than single interventions? Are there any synergistic effects? And, the simple answer is nutrition did again improve by 0.15 to 0.20 uh, standard deviations. There was no additional effect of WASH. And then the SHINE trial uh, in, in Zimbabwe, also looking at combined effects of nutrition and WASH. Um, and again, um, exactly the same answer. The nutrition had an impact of about 0.20 LHZ and no effect of additional effects of WASH. And this is not because those studies were poorly done. The, the quality of the study implementation is extremely high. Um, and it's the first time that this has been tested in a randomized control trial. There are a lot of observational studies that suggest that there would be effects. So in a sense, even though the effects are negative, it's very important that these studies are now available. And we may, uh, we need to try and understand why these studies have failed to have a measurable impact on child growth. And one theory that we are building our project on is that neither of these projects was able to adequately control the exposure of the young children to animal uh, excreta. The most benefit study basically did not, did not control at all. The SHAM trial did try to control, but uh, in the end, we're not able to fully uh, control uh, the exposure of the children. We also don't have any ideology uh, yet that we can build or strengthen our uh, conclusions on. Now let's switch gears a little bit and uh, go to another driver for our project, which is the uh, Ethiopia Livestock Master Plan, one part of the overall uh, growth development plan of the Ethiopian uh, government. Um, they are recognizing that there will be an increase in demand and attrition of meat for animal source uh, foods. Um, and one of the ways that uh, they try to uh, 
increase their animal source production is by improving, uh, uh, increasing uh, poultry uh, production by moving from the traditional scavenging family poultry to what is called improved semi scavenging family poultry uh, systems. And the livestock plan has a very ambitious uh, target within six years to increase by 250%. Uh, also, using more productive uh, chickens that produce more eggs and, and more meat. Um, so, on the one hand, the positive impact of that livestock master plan may be that they may provide improved access of pregnant mothers and young children to animal source foods with all the nutritional benefits that are associated with it. On the other hand, there will be higher poultry densities around the, the families' homes uh, because these animals will still be semi scavenging and the exposure of the infectious disease agents uh, through uh, contact with the chickens may reduce or even negate the nutritional benefits uh, through that uh, increased uh, exposure. So one of the pathogens, and James explained that uh, in quite some detail, that is now most uh, associated with stunting is Campylobacter. And when you think about how do children, how do people get exposed to Campylobacter, uh, it's we know that uh, particularly chickens, but also other livestock, are the major reservoirs of human exposure to Campylobacter throughout the world. Most of the data come from industrialized uh, countries, and invariably, it's chicken meat, uh, other chicken exposure sources that are the key uh, exposure uh, sources. And the transmission may occur by different pathways. It can be through food, it can be through direct contact with the animals, it can be through contact uh, uh, with the environment that has been contaminated by the animals. And the relative contributions of these pathways, they vary by, by setting. There's very few data, but estimates are that foodborne transmission is more important in industrialized countries, whereas environmental and direct contact is more important in low and middle income uh, countries. But again, there's very few data for developing countries overall, and particularly for, uh, for children to support that uh, hypothesis. Also important is that most infections with Campylobacter are asymptomatic. They're not associated with diarrhea. I'll show a graph a little bit later on. But they still do induce, on the one hand, acquired immunity. So what you do see is that very young children develop diarrhea from Campylobacter. Above the age of two to four years, it's very rare to observe uh, any individual that has diarrhea that's uh, associated with Campylobacter because of the acquired immunity. So that's a good thing. The bad thing is that uh, even the asymptomatic infections with Campylobacter can cause this environmental enteric uh, dysfunction with all the impacts on the growth uh, that it may have. Our hypothesis is that irrespective of the transmission pathway, so whether it's food or animal, if we are able to control these reservoirs, if we are able to reduce the impact of these reservoirs on the overall living environment, that we then uh, expect that this will lead, uh, lead to reduction in colonization, including asymptomatic uh, colonization. This diagram shows the importance of asymptomatic colonization. These are data from the Mary Lee study, uh, based on the immunoassays uh, that, that have been published already. Uh, and this graph developed by uh, Nitya Singh, my postdoc, uh, splits up the population of children between zero and two years of age into three groups. Uh, children with diarrhea who have Campylobacter, children without diarrhea who exclude Campylobacter, and children uh, without diarrhea who do, uh, with, yeah, without diarrhea or with diarrhea who do not exclude Campylobacter. And what you can see is that, first of all, there's a huge difference uh, between countries, but some countries like Bangladesh, for example, you can see that at the age of two, up to 75% of all children uh, will exclude Campylobacter in their Thesis. It's also very high in Tanzania, about 50%, much lower in South Africa, in, in Brazil, and, and the other countries are somewhere in between. It probably has to do with, uh, with, with all the different exposure sources, but the poorest countries, uh, the children are almost permanently colonized with, uh, with Campbell and we don't know if that's long-term colonization by one agent or if it's repeated exposure, but the um, the impact is that these children will be fighting those Campylobacter infections uh, through most of their early life. And that's what we want to prevent. So we have the underlying hypothesis for our study are that um, if you move from a traditional poultry system to the semi-scavenging uh, chickens, the beneficial effects of animal ownership and animal source food consumption may be negated by environmental enteric dysfunction. 
Um, and if we can break that cycle, uh, that might lead to less camper effects, less EEP, and hopefully better growth uh, of the children. So that's what we will try to test uh, in our study. Um, the vision that, uh, that we have for this project is that uh, we have this research now showing that young children who eat chicken eggs grow better and may gain lifelong benefits. Um, what we try to do is test on the one hand the benefits of improved poultry production by smallholders aiming to produce eggs for their children and feed these eggs to their children. But we also examine then the advantage of protecting the children from the chicken droppings, which are by far the highest exposure source, by using coops so that the chickens can be kept away from the living environments of the children, and that should further improve their health and the growth uh, of these uh, children. Um, more formally, in scientific terms, uh, the hypotheses are that against the background of increased, increased chicken production by small farmers, asymptomatic colonization with Campylobacter bacteria and we're looking at children between six and 18 months of age will be reduced by limiting their exposure to chicken excreta through animal husbandry interventions and animal hygiene training. And that, that then will lead to a reduced prevalence of environmental and enteric dysfunction. And if we combine that with improved access to eggs and other household basic uh, nutrition and wash training, that will increase the linear growth of children between six and 18 months of age. So we're going to be looking at a critical time window where most of the stunting occurs, as, as Mark explained. We'll be working in uh, the Haramaya, Moreda, and Ethiopia. This is uh, um, Ethiopia, this is the Oromio region, and then, no, uh, I feel like move up. Uh, yeah, this is Ethiopia. Uh, this is the Eastern Harari zone. This is the Haramaya, Moreda. And then we are now working in five uh, cabalis within that uh, Moreda where Hanamaya University is fully enumerating uh, all the households uh, which will provide us with our uh, source population. They do basically a uh, health and demographic uh, survey enumeration. So we have a lot of information about these uh, uh, areas. When we start studying the full study, we'll take 12 cabalis in this part of the Haramaya Moreda that will provide us with our study population. Uh, we'll plan to implement a cluster randomized uh, controlled trial with three arms. The first arm um, where we will have a full treatment, uh, where we will provide the, the families with uh, 10 chickens of improved breed. And we will also provide movable poultry houses. These are the houses that Haramai University has designed. So we will ask the families to keep the chicken in those houses day and night. Um, we'll also provide them with health care and not unimportantly the feed because now these chickens cannot scavenge anymore. So they're completely dependent on the feed that they will get from the families. Um, we're also aware that it's not only the chickens of the index uh, family that may contaminate uh, it. So we're also giving all the neighboring families in the same compound, we give them five chickens in movable houses, those families get 10 chickens because they need we need to be sure that they produce enough eggs to feed the children. Uh, five chickens is the average ownership, and we'll, because we're giving them improved breed chickens, they will have much more benefits from those chickens than the chickens uh, they have. And these families will also get nutritional and IG training. The partial treatment group will receive the same intervention, but they will not receive the move for poultry houses. So the children, the, the chickens will still be uh, allowed to roam freely so that we can test the impact of the groups. And then the control, situation will be the current uh, situation uh, scavenging chickens of traditional breeds which are often kept in the home overnight to protect them from predators so yeah, those are our three treatment arms that we will be looking at now the um the, the hypothesis that underlie our uh, study are uh, based on relatively few data so as in many projects uh, gates has asked us to first uh, engage in really the formative research which we are setting up now. And we have different uh, objectives. One is uh, an ethnographic uh, study. Kevin Bard was an anthropologist from the University of Florida. We did that part actually starting already uh, this month, where we try to better understand the local community context and the social cultural beliefs, practices, and all the organizations around poultry keeping, about dietary intake, about wash, and about child growth uh, in relation to the Campylobacter uh, epidemiology. And we'll explore the community level, the opportunities and the barriers uh, to these interventions, what drives people to accept groups, what may be barriers for them 
not to accept books so that in the end we can better design our trial and also the, uh, the trainings that we, uh, we need to provide. This will go to informal rapid ethnographic uh, methods and also be observing uh, and discussing with the, uh, the communities uh, all these details about how do they manage animal feces, how do they manage poultry, uh, what do they think of these interventions, uh, what's their current ideas about food safety, child health and growth, nutrition and care, wash, gender roles, community organization. So we'll try to get as much understanding of the local population context uh, as we can through this ethnographic uh, work. And that'll define our further formative research and it also inform our randomized control trial. Uh, then uh, later this year, we'll do uh, a more um, sampling based uh, work. Um, uh, we'll do a lot of microbiology focusing on Campylobacter, looking at um, what's the prevalence in that region of Campylobacter in children? What's the prevalence in chickens? What's the prevalence in other domestic animals? Um, we'll isolate a lot of those bacteria, look at the species, also look at the genotypic uh, diversity, because, and uh, one was uh, briefly alluded to that, when you compare at the genotypic level the Campylobacter isolates from different animal reservoirs, they have very specific signatures. So you can actually uh, use the genetic signatures to understand in the children what proportion of the infections comes from chickens, what comes from goats, what comes from cattle, from other animals. And uh, obviously, if there's a large proportion associated with other animals, we need to take that into account in our uh, design. So we'll be looking at 100 children and animals in their uh, environment. Um, the next question is, what about EED? Uh, how prevalent is that? So we will use the, uh, the, the L2R test and the fecal MPO, the indicators for MED that have been uh, discussed uh, before. We'll also do anthropometric uh, measurements in these same children. We'll do observational studies on the hygiene-related uh, behavior to better understand their exposure to potential sources of uh, contamination. Um, and we will also do a lot of work on the agricultural and environmental factors that uh, will affect our, our intervention. Uh, the presence um, uh, and numbers of domestic animals, how are they managed, uh, how can they contaminate the environment, how many families actually do we need to uh, equip with those scoops uh, to protect the children uh, from, uh, from any chickens uh, in their uh, environment. Uh, is it really feasible to keep these chickens in the movable poultry houses uh, all day? How can we stimulate the families to accept that? How can we assure and monitor compliance, and also preliminary studies on uh, what is the impact of placing those groups on the prevalence of Campylobacter in the environment. We'll do some sampling to test uh, the effectiveness of the intervention also there. Um, um, and we'll do that um, partly in 100 households. We'll do a trial, a much more detailed trial, with five households that we will equip with, uh, with those uh, groups. And then, um, we will have a go no go decision, and that may also include that we will modify our uh, design so that we can uh, address the concerns that may be raised by the formal research. We expect stunting to be high, more than 30%. We also expect uh, EED uh, to, be, uh, to be high. We expect to find quite a lot of chemical back to the children, and that quite a high proportion of that will be associated with, uh, with chickens. We also expect that once we place those groups, that we can really control the presence of visible uh, droppings. So these will be our evaluation criteria to decide whether we can go ahead with the design plan or whether we need to modify the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the design. So in conclusion, uh, malnutrition causes a high disease burden in the developing uh, world and stunting in early life condemns a child to a life of disadvantage. Inadequate nutrition and environmental dysfunctions are the major drivers of malnutrition and linking to this environmental enteric dysfunction, chronic infections with enteric pathogenic bacteria, specifically Campylobacter, are major drivers. Uh, and uh, we also know efforts to prevent stunting have to date had limited access. So what we will try to do again is to provide children with better access to animal source foods, to increase sanitation uh, efforts uh, in, by focusing specifically on animal excreta and evaluate that in a randomized uh, control trial. So hopefully in a couple of years, uh, we can meet again here and we'll be able to present you the results of this study. Thank you.
what we're going to do at this point is open up the discussion, uh, open up the floor for questions and discussion regarding the last two presentations, or for that matter, for if there are questions related to any of the earlier presentations, uh, we would welcome them as well. Do we have questions? Well, good morning and thanks for organizing this. It's very, very interesting. So congratulations. I have a question for uh, Dr. Havilar, which is about, in particular, the poultry part of the cage part. Um, and it's really about, have you thought of looking into health indicators of poultry, for poultry health, in the chickens that you will rear in a different way. Because um, yesterday when we had our, our meeting, um, it transpired that, of course, if you keep chickens away from the ground, they're not gonna get um, worms, they're not gonna get mites, they're not gonna get a whole series of other um, pathogens that would certainly reduce their productivity because they get skinnier, they don't lay as many eggs. And so I was just wondering whether tagging in or adding on a small animal health part of this project could you know, help you uh, obtain more comprehensive results. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, that, that's definitely something that we will be looking um, into uh, already now in this initial study, although it will only last for a month. But we're developing um, indicators to, to monitor uh, the, uh, the health of the chickens. Uh, our Maya team will go there at least every week and we'll also ask the owners to monitor daily the, the health of their uh, chickens. Uh, so we're very aware of that. And we're looking at policy specialists at Amara Armaya University to ensure that we also obviously provide uh, the standard health care and vaccines, uh, the Newcastle vaccine, for example, because uh, these chickens need to survive and need to stay healthy. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. I, it seems like the transmission rate from chicken to human is critical in this. And you mentioned genotyping, and I'm assuming that's genotyping both clones from human as well as uh, chicken to look at aspects of transmission rates. I'm wondering if it might also um, be feasible to ablate colonization from antibiotic and look at reinfection rates. Um, is that part of the Study. Um, the first part uh, definitely is we will be collecting in, in the form of the research uh, about 100 isolates from chickens, from goats, from cattle, and from other animals uh, that, that might be around. But as far as we see now, it's particularly uh, those three um, animal species. Um, so, and we fully uh, sequence them together with FDA, the Geno Tracker. Uh, uh, initiative that, that Wilson mentioned uh, will provide us with the sequencing service and we'll use our signatures in these different animals to, to compare that. So that's uh, one part. The second part about the recolonization rates, um, we're not planning to do any say, experimental uh, decolonization using antimicrobials. What we will do, and Dr. Young uh, from the biostatistics department uh, will lead that part uh, in, in the RCP is developed dynamic models, uh, so we use mathematical models to try and better understand the whole dynamics uh, of the transmission through uh, from chickens to children to the, within the chicken reservoir uh, and, and within uh, the households. Uh, so we're basically also using our observations to try and understand those dynamics. We we'll use mathematical modeling rather than experimental interventions. Other questions? Why don't you come? I'm sorry. We don't have a handheld microphone. That's very interesting presentation. Thank you very much and, and, uh, for alerting me to this symposium, too. Um, I was thinking about the flies, chickens that are roaming around uh, feed on the maggots. 
And so is there any uh, intention to get some kind of a measure of flies as a nuisance and also of flies as uh, you know, transmitting eye diseases? Um, we don't have that in our design yet. Um, as I said, we, we focus on the link from the reservoir to the children by using genotyping. And we don't have the budget to look at what are the exact pathways. It would be nice to have that. And there may be other opportunities, there may be other grants that we can apply for that would provide us with a much more detailed understanding of what are the pathways. Is it uh, exposure the children to the contaminated soils? Uh, is it related to that direct? contact with the chickens, is it flies, uh, is it water, is it uh, food, uh, that, I mean, there's a lot of questions that uh, that we have to even answer uh, now, because even though we have a decent budget, uh, it's still uh, limited, uh, and we're actively um, building a list of things that we would like to do in addition and try to find uh, additional funding purposes. Uh, so, flies, yes, um, we know that uh, in, in Chicken operations in Europe, uh, the main uh, vehicle for bringing chemical better into the chicken houses is flies. Uh, the Danes have uh, completely packed all chicken houses in fly netting, and so so that they could reduce chemical better prevalence by more than 75%. Uh, percent. Uh, so it's definitely uh, flies are uh, affected. There's also suggestions that human infections are uh, mediated by uh, by flies, uh, but it's very difficult actually. To catch a fine and find chemical better on them. Uh, people have tried it and, and last year without success. So it's not an easy, um, an easy question uh, to study. Go ahead. So the next question is from Jim Yasmin uh, to Dr. Havala. What does semi scavenging mean for the chickens? Are they loose for part of the day, or are they yes? Are they loose for part of the day, or enclosed in the mobile coops all the time? That is the first question. The second question is, and if the mobile coops are the envisioned safe egg production system, what's the envisioned cost of production, including investment costs and operating costs? Um, and he actually sent a correction. He said. My question should have been with the safe egg production system, what is the cost per egg available for consumption, assuming there will be some increase in production system? So, so semi scavenging uh, is not well defined. Um, I think it depends a lot on, on the individual poultry owner, how they, how they manage that. Um, at least they will be roaming freely around the compound for uh, for the day. Uh, typically in Ethiopia and many other countries uh, at night, uh, people will in some way uh, house the, the chickens to protect them from predators. Uh, traditionally, uh, it would be uh, in the homes. Uh, what we see when these semi-scavenging uh, systems are introduced is that people may try to build other enclosures uh, to house them during the night because chickens are a lot bigger. There's also more chickens typically, so keeping them all in the home will be uh, more difficult. Uh, and so they use old kitchens or they construct some kind of uh, fencing uh, that, that they can use to protect the chickens at night from predators. Um, the other question is yes, we do realize that uh, this will have um, an impact uh, on the cost of the production uh, of the eggs. In that sense, uh, we're doing a trial, so we're not trying to set up sustainable system for egg production yet what we try to do is provide a proof of principle that if you um, break the cycle uh, between chicken droppings and uh, the, uh, the the children that this would have a positive effect on uh, on the child growth uh, the next challenge would then be how can this be translated into a sustainable uh, system that will require more feed that will require more management uh, of the chickens we try to report the impact uh, on the families as much as we can. We also try to link in some way to the economic models that underlie the uh, Ethiopian uh, livestock master plan. So 
the movement that I kind of believe in the future systems uh, part of the lifestyle map with some level of, of economic analysis, but it's not going to be very deep. Um, we will collect some information and uh, do realize that in that sense, this is not uh, promote, proposing a sustainable intervention. It's uh, providing a proof of principle uh, if an intervention like that works and it's worth trying to develop into something that would be fully sustainable. The next question um, is actually referring to Dr. Maneri's uh, presentation. It is from Tarek. There's two questions. The first question says, how the antibiotics intervention can be effective to heal EED on this era of antimicrobial resistance? And the second question is, how the albendazole, albendazole the warming used to heal EED? Sure, uh, thank the uh, remote participants for their questions. Um, antibiotics haven't been shown to help the EED. So there was a negative trial about that. Um, so I, I don't think we, we should try to link these uh, trials where they have antibiotics just being given periodically in the community and in a dose to something about EED. Unless you want to try to postulate in between, they're somehow getting rid of or changing the microbiota. The way the data seems to be emerging to be able to, to pick on one particular study, I mean, it was a, a, a study in, that was done in Niger where these were showed, malnourished children who all got an antibiotic, um, amoxicillin, and then they got. Um, tested in their stools for antibiotic resistance. And what we saw, it wasn't my study, but what was seen, it was done at my university, was that after a week, all the people who had received these antibiotics would develop resistance. And after a month, that resistance was present in about half of those people. And after three months, it was gone. And, and so to me, that really put a lot of question in the notion that, um, we're well, using a lot of antibiotics just has to promote a lot of resistance. Uh, and, and I'm of the opinion that, that the fears of antibiotic resistance are, are um, out of proportion today to the benefits of using antibiotics. Did you make the second question? Oh, how it is all works? I mean, it's, it's a, a Anti-parasitic drug, which which kills the, the parasites, for um, the mechanism how it works, I don't remember. Other question? Actually, I'm going to come back to ask Ari one additional question. Um, I, I know that in some of the studies with which we are familiar in Haiti, that have tried to set up, you know, small scale chicken operations, you know, small little coop in a farmer's house. It is, it clearly is not long-term economically sustainable because they can't compete with the big producers. I mean, how does, how does this figure in with some of the, you know, things that you are contemplating in terms of long-term sustainability in these countries? Is it potentially sustainable or, or how does this factor? As you say, that question is out of my league uh, <laughs> because that's much more of an economist. Thing. How long would you like to comment uh, on that? Because Sylvain so looks much more at, say, also the economic sustainability of chicken production. This is actually an excuse for me to come down here. I'm going to just dodge the question. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm not an economist, but I, I was talking with Derek, who is an economist, and he's, he's not very optimistic in terms of looking at um, you know, changing these, uh, how can I say, the efficiency of these production systems when you're talking about really difficult stuff. So, I don't know about you, people, but it seems very similar to what you have as a context. And, um, He's extremely sort of uh, dismissive about really making these transformational changes. They're going to make the sector competitive. Um, however, you know, I think there are some um, 
marginal gains, I guess, on the steps, on the ladder towards that. Uh, and then, you know, you might in some ways could translate to benefits, mm -hmm. good investment. So, and that's really not really well understood. Um, in terms of where, you know, whether these potential benefits can lie in as the transition happens. So I know I dodged the question a little bit, but hopefully it gave you a little bit of information. But I, I, I see the moment being down here because there was just one point that came out of the Shine presentations that maybe you're not aware of that was really quite relevant. It kind of suggested that, yeah, there was not much impact in terms of wash, the additional elements of wash. But what was uh, quite interesting was that once you factored in the intensity of exposure of the wash elements, uh, then a much clearer picture of the rooms in terms of the potential benefits. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that it makes a difference to how intensely you, 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 you promote this. And often you overlook that, um, I think that in, in the uh, Bangladesh uh, wash trial, they embedded a weekly. Uh, weekly business at the household level. And whilst in Kenya, I think they, they uh, could only guarantee one thing. And that makes a huge difference in terms of being able to share these things. Sorry, come on down. Just felt I need to say something because I'm an economist, but I think, and I'm part of the last so lab. Uh, and I think that comparing a uh, smallholder chicken or any kind of production with commercial is misleading because in the families, in the households we work in, each activity is part of, is it a part of a whole. It's very much the synergies that are relevant. So a small scale chicken production or two cows cannot be compared in terms of efficiency or profitability with larger operations. But what we are interested in is kind of synergies across different activities, for instance, Byproducts from agriculture can use a speed. And so this is part of the household system, which doesn't transact to, to market. So I just wanted to add this that it's kind of uh, the way in the last stock lab, I think we should and we are looking into is to look at the complementarity between income, um, generations, nutritional benefits, health benefits, women's empowerment, and from the holistic perspective, I think it makes sense to promote these activities, even if they are not efficient as compared to larger scale. Okay. I'm, I'm not an economist in this, well, before the other person. Uh, but I'm, I, uh, many of the speakers have said, well, this will be sustainable, this will be sustainable, this will be sustainable. I think we got to take a uh, a bit of a hard look at that adjective, which is, <clears throat> um, to me, sustainability has a temporal dimension for how long? And uh, <clears throat> and maybe that would help. You will say this would be sustainable for how long? Uh, many two-year projects of, uh, of donors uh, claim sustainability afterwards, so that everything falls apart. Uh, we know that. So, so my, my plea here is uh, uh, just uh, watch out for that word, and uh, and if you use it, give some idea of the time frame. Okay. Any further comments? I just can't not respond to this sustainable thing. Uh, I mean, it's a word I've absolutely hated for 25 years. It doesn't make a bit of sense. What in life, you know, entropy is very powerful and things are going to break up. What, what doesn't require some kind of input? So it's not like, you know, from it's a pretty unrealistic thing for donors to think that, you know, well, it just starts and then just keeps going. Uh, I mean, so it, 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 to me, it's not all just a technical thing, but how much, what, you have to put something in all the time to keep something going. What is that? And that's reason, it's not unreasonable or, or on, um, you know, on, <laughs> uh, so anyway, that, that, that's sort of or how I would try to answer a question like that. Um, just uh, one other comment here, maybe it's too late to say it, but 
you know, it's, especially because the audience are not terribly well locked into this, but this word stunt, you know, it seems like a verb, right? It ends in the ing, and what's the deal with it? But it's being used as a noun of having crossed a certain threshold. And, you know, the association studies or like what was what Derek presented, I mean, what, what I think one of the real limitations there is that we're measuring cumulative growth at two years of age or something, and we're taking how they ate yesterday and trying to make a connection between that. And so be careful. I mean, what I like, I always emphasize in my own work, certainly in, in the stuff I saw, I think it was in the doors, James. So, you're talking about change in life. You can only do something about what you have a handle on the present. Things that happened way in the past are there and they're still cycle them. So <laughs> we need a more positive note to end on right now. Right? <laughs> do you want to do the whole things together? Well, I'm fully unprepared to do this, but let me start by thanking our guests for coming in um, from out of town. I'm really sorry that Jamal couldn't speak this up speak this morning with us, but he had to see about his health. Um, but can we please have a round of applause again for all of our guests? Um, I, I do want to say a quick note, um, thanks to our sponsors, the Center for African Studies and the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems, um, who sponsored this event, our collaborators on both the Gates Project and the Livestock Innovation Lab with USAID. Um, but I also want to just underscore how fantastic Fantastically, this um, this project really embodies what's fantastic about the University of Florida, and that is when you look around the room. I'm so glad that Alo took a moment to ask who was in the room, because there are not that many events where you can get 60 people in a room from as many different disciplines on campus uh, for a morning. So thank you for these four hours of your time. Thank you for taking an interest in the project, and again, um, really appreciate all the collaborators coming in today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.